talking. Okay, come on in. Sure. What? Good. Yeah, all my trips are quick. Okay. So, three very My wife's a first grade teacher, and she taught me something. She's a better teacher than I am. She, and she taught me something about teaching that I didn't know. She said, when the kids are loud, you speak softer. Because if you try to speak louder than they do, they speak louder, and it becomes a contest. It actually works, actually, but you know, I still haven't mastered it. One of these days, I've got to get her to come into class with me and teach the class jointly. Okay. Three very quick notes about the quiz. The first is, as you probably already realized, talking to the person next to you, there were two, di two different quizzes. Okay. <laughs> they were exact, I mean, let me be clear though, they were exactly identical in terms of content and structure, but different problems. So one company was Colombian pesos, the other was Brazilian rias. I've always done this because, let's face it, I, you know, with this many people, I know you're honest, but there are some bad apples. Okay? I can't stop cheating, but I can try to make it difficult, and this is the simplest device I can think. So the quizzes were actually sorted in alternate order, so when you pass them out, the person next to you got a different quiz. Which does create an interesting issue if you have the perfect solution to the wrong quiz. That is, in a sense, almost unexplainable, unless you've got the psychic ability to do your neighbor's quiz by accident. I, I, I don't think you should even try to come and explain it to me. I hope it doesn't happen. It happens at least once every two or three years. Okay. And I just pass it on and I say, you must be either something special or you just copied off your neighbor's quiz. Second, uh, and, and I, I, the, what's going to happen now is the quizzes are being alphabetically uh, sorted. That's why I asked you to write your name so people could read it. They'll be sorted. So by the time I finish the class, they will be in a stack on my desk, and I will start grading. And I will keep grading, and I will keep grading till I'm done. And when I'm done, I will tell you the quizzes are done. Come and pick them up. I'm not bringing it back to class and passing it. Can, can you imagine that will take a whole class? So the way it'll, it'll be, you can pick them up, is I turn them face down, and they will be left in three stacks alphabetically, and you come and pick your quiz off from the stack. Now that's why I asked you to write your name on the back. If you didn't, it's not the end of the world. I'm not going to put a zero or something. I'll just have to write your name for you, which is a pain in the neck, and I'll be really pissed off at you. And if you do it on all three quizzes, I'll get really pissed off, but one quiz, I can let it pass. But that's why I wanted to write the name on the back, because that way, and you know what I, where, where in the alphabet your name falls, right? So this is in Barnes & Noble. There's no browsing through the other quizzes saying, I don't know where my name is. I was just looking through every quiz. Just pick your damn quiz and move on. So it's done. So I will let you know when the quiz is done, when they're ready to pick up. And I will also send you the solution with my grading template. 
So basically, you'll see the solutions, and you'll see how, you know, what I took points off for. Check your grading. I screw up. I screw up all the time. So if I've screwed up on your quiz, don't bitch and moan about it. Don't stew in your own juices. Just come on in, and I'll fix it. And I'll also make a confession. I hate writing multiple choice questions. Absolutely hate them. But uh, this is the only quiz you're going to see multiple choice. I'm done with them. Because on corporate governance, there's really no numerical way I can test you, right? So it has to be multiple choice. And I will give you my answer. And if you deeply disagree with my answer, if I've taken a half a point off, I will let you come in and make your case but you've got to make it a really strong case, which means you've got to look up references. So for instance, where I said there are long-tenured CEOs, with, you know, and if I give an answer and you come up with a different answer, if you can find me five research papers that back up your answer, or three research papers, it happens. I, and there are people who actually work that hard for half a point. And I look at them and say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I give them the half a point and move on. But if you feel that intensely about an answer that you think is right and I've taken off a half a point, the rest is kind of numerical. I try not to talk about the quiz right after the quiz because it's like, I wouldn't say ripping off scabs because the scabs haven't formed yet. It's open wounds, I'm poking at them. But the second problem, I did ask you to compute your cost of equity in Brazilian reais or Colombian pesos, right? So th what I was asking you to do is giving you a currency choice for the cost of equity. I was looking through some of the quizzes as I was going through, and this is, I mean, it's, if you made this mistake, don't beat yourself up because it can happen. I'm asking you to compute the cost of equity in Brazilian reais for the Brazilian portion of the company. I said for the company. Do you see where I'm going? The currency choice drives what? Your risk-free rate. The beta was given, but what is the equity risk premium a function of? Not what currency you've done the analysis, and otherwise I could take a Venezuelan company and make it look like it has a low cost of equity just because I do it in US dollars, your equity risk premium still has to reflect all three countries that you're in, weighted by how much revenue you get in each one. So again, you know, live and learn, and you know, it's not the end of the world. I'm a very generous grader, so I'm looking for, I'll be quite honest, I'm looking for reasons to give you credit, not reasons to take it away. So sometimes you get these quizzes with numbers scribbled all over, backwards, sideways. I'm looking through, so hey, maybe there's a right number here, right? <laughs> so I am not looking to, and what I'm trying to say is, maybe not on this quiz, but starting this quiz, show me process. Show me what you're trying to do, because it makes it easier for me to find things that you're doing right than to find things that you're doing wrong. One final point about this quiz, a few of you asked me why I don't allow laptops. Part of it is just the security. The securing of a laptop is, I know a few people brought iPads, you could, you know, but iPads at least, you know, I can, I can check to see what you're doing. Laptops, once all of you open your laptops, God only knows what's going on behind there. <laughs> Part of it is also for your own protection. Last year, actually, as I, 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 I had this good luck to teach a small class, which almost never happens. Two small classes, it was an executive class, and I decided to give the same quiz to both classes and give one class, the option of using their laptops, and the other class, what we're doing now. You know that the people who use their laptops actually got 25% lower than the people? And there's actually a reason for it, because when you open your laptop, you start entering numbers into cells, you got to double check the cells, you got to write equations and functions, you're double checking. It was taking them three, because they were doing things like five plus two in, the, in Excel. 5% plus 2%, you, know, you put the equal. You're going to make all kinds of mistakes along the way. And that's actually a general thing. If you're working on these quizzes, there are 90% of the numbers in this quiz. You really didn't need a calculator. Right? On the third problem, maybe to do a levered beta, because it was 6.5% local currency rate, 2.5% default spread. 65 minus 2.5, you don't need a calculator to get to 4%. So if you can work in your head, it saves you time of not having to go through that process. Because I know time pressure, I mean, 30, 30 minutes seems to fly by, right? And it will, because if you check your notes, you use your calculator, you don't trust your calculator, you have to enter the same equation three times before you can trust the number. It is going to take time away from the quiz. So quiz is behind you. 
Nigeria. It's actually, I think Nigeria gets a bad rap. It's actually fun. So I'm planning my next trip to Venezuela next month, followed by North Korea the month after. Right? <laughs> I have to find a good North Korean company to value, so if you can come up with a few, I'd, I'd love to know. But I guess I have to watch out for people who might wipe my face with wet towels, you know, <laughs> or whatever variant thereof. No. So let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about betas, risk-free rates, risk premiums, and all of that led to a cost of equity, right? So the cost of equity is what you demand, or as an investor, when you invest in the equity of a company. And let's face it, equity is the driving force for businesses. You need equity to essentially run a business. But there's another way of raising capital, which is debt. So today's session, I'd like to talk about what debt is and what cost to attach to debt. So let's talk about what it is that makes debt debt. This sounds like a stupid question. You're saying, I open up a balance sheet, I should be able to tell you what debt is because it's right there, it says debt. If it were only that simple. So I'm going to give you three criteria I look for to determine that something is debt and then I'm going to try to apply this to a balance sheet to see which items pass the test. So here's the first thing I'm looking for to classify something as debt. I need a contractual commitment, right? Debt Debt has contractual commitments. When I issue equity, I might tell you I'll pay dividends. I might actually mean it. But if I don't pay dividends, you can't sue me. Dividends are not a contractual commitment. They're kind of an agreement to do something. Debt, on the other hand, leads to a contractual commitment. Second, that commitment to make payments is usually tax deductible around the world. There are parts of the world, especially in the Middle East, where this is not true. But in general, when you borrow money, you sign that contractual agreement, you make the payments, those payments are tax deductible. And third, if you don't make those payments, bad things happen to you. If you're an individual, your knees might get broken. If you're a corporation, you could default, right? Fixed commitment, which is contractually set, tax deductible, loss of control. Let's use those criteria, and I'm going to throw some items off a balance sheet at you, and you tell me based on those criteria whether you would classify these items as debt or not. Let's start easy. How about corporate bonds? They meet the criteria? Yeah. Contractual payment, tax deductible, loss of control, of course. How about long-term bank loans? Obviously, right? How about short-term bank loans? You see why I drew the distinction? I'm amazed at how often I see cost of capital com computations that count only long-term debt. What are you trying to tell me? That if you borrow money short-term, you don't have to make the payment? All interest-bearing debt is obviously debt, short-term and long-term. Now let's get to the tricky items. What about accounts payable? Should I treat that as debt? Tell me what criterion it fails. Because if you're telling me no, it's got to be fail one of the three criterion. What is it? I'm sorry? Fails with a loss of control. If you don't pay your suppliers, you could be taken to court and shut down. Right? I mean, otherwise people just stop paying suppliers if there's no consequence. So there is loss of control. Is there an explicit interest payment? Notice how I phrase this. There's no, is there an explicit interest payment? Not really, but is there an implicit interest payment? What form does it take with supply credit? You say there's an implicit interest payment. What form does it take? No, but, but when, you're, so when you use supply credit, what does the supplier do? He supplies stuff to you and says, you can pay me right away, you can pay me in 60 days, right? And he'd like you to pay right away, so what does he offer you usually to pay right away? Discount. Usually you get a discount, so the implicit cost of supplier credit, it's like an interest payment, is that discount. Because it's not made explicit, I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying it's not a liability, that would be crazy. I'm not saying not paying it is not, having, is not going to have consequences because that's not true. But I'm not going to count it as debt because those lost discounts are not made explicit. Once in a while I get pushback from people saying, but in my company, most of the debt takes the form of accounts payable and supplier credit. I really want to include it in debt. And I say, okay, here's what you need to do. Go into last year's financials and figure out how much of your cost of goods sold is coming from this lost discount. Tell me how much, and a few hours later, a few minutes later, the person emails me back saying, I've changed my mind. 
Because if you try to go into cost of goods sold and try to figure out how much lost discounts there were, it's almost impossible to do. So the reason we don't include supplier credit, accounts payable, deferred taxes as debt is because there is no explicit interest expense. In the US, increasingly, accountants are feeling the urge to put on things like underfunded pension obligations, right? First, uh, is everybody familiar with how pension obligations are structured in the US company? There are two ways you can have a pension. You can have a defined contribution plan or a defined benefit plan. In a defined contribution plan, how's the pension run? Every month you set aside a portion of your income into that pension. The company invests your pension in good places or bad, but your pension is a function of what you make on your money. It's not, there's no guaranteed amount. That's a defined, so in a defined contribution plan, you can never have an underfunded pension obligation or overfunded pension obligation. It's whatever you put into the pension is what you get back. In a defined benefit plan, the company actually promises you a fixed salary, fixed pension. You put money into the pension plan, the company invests that money, and it invests the money in such a way that it hopes to deliver that fixed payment. That's a defined benefit plan. Now do you see why you can get underfunding or overfunding with that plan? If I collect your money and I invest it in horrible places, I lose 20% of my portfolio. I still have promised you $1,000 a month starting at the age of 65. I now no longer have the assets to back it up. I have an underfunded pension plan. Until the 1970s, 1980s, maybe into the 1990s, US companies used to have defined benefit plans. So you look at the old companies, the GMs, the Ford. The older the company, the more likely it is that you will see. Disney, for instance, until 2012, which was two years before my son joined them, still had a pension you could get from Disney that was a defined. For those companies, you can already see that if I'm looking at the company, I'm looking at the assets of the company versus the assets set aside into the pension plan versus their expected liabilities. And if you're underfunded, they're going to show it on the balance sheet as a liability. That was a long story. So now my question is, let's say you're looking at GM and it says underfunded pension plan, five billion. Should I count that as debt? To, again, let's go through it. For it to be counted as debt, what does it have to create? A contractual commitment, right? So what's the question you need to ask? When I show an underfunded pension obligation on my balance sheet, what happens? In the US, nothing. In the US, you have to show it for informational purposes. It's not a regulatory requirement. It doesn't mean you have to set aside one-tenth of it for the next 10 years. So in the US, should we treat it as, as debt? No, but in Europe, if you have an underfunded pension plan, there are consequences. You might be required in some European countries to set aside money to cover that underfunding. There you might treat it as that. The rules can be different. So that's why I create these three criteria. You will find when you're looking at your company that you might have to look at those line items and say what belongs in debt, what shouldn't. So all interest bearing debt. If, you're defined, if your underfunded pension obligation creates contractual commitments, you might count that. Is there some, anything else I should be counting? I mean, that's all, everything on the balance sheet. Are there items off the balance sheet that might meet these criteria? I'll give you, I'm sorry, what? Derivatives. Derivatives, no, derivatives are contingent liabilities, right? Derivatives, you can make money, lose money. So in a sense, derivatives essentially will, you will show as contingent. They're not debt, they're not equity. They could become debt, and when they do become debt, they will show up as debt. But let's not jump the gun on derivatives, because derivatives can be this big item that creates no consequences, profits, or losses. I'll give you a clue. Walmart. How does Walmart grow? They don't grow very much anymore, but if they did grow, what do they do? They open a new store, right? Acquisitions might be it, but they open a new store. Do they own the real estate usually in the store? No, they do. Usually, most retailers don't own the real estate, so they're not in the real estate business. What do they do instead? They lease the store. How does the lease work? You sign a 12-year contract to pay a million dollars every year for the next 12 years. That's a typical mall store is a 12-year contract. So if you're the Gap, you sign a mall store contract, you've agreed to pay a million dollars every year for the next 12 years. Contractual commitment? Yes. Tax deductible? Yeah, lease expenses are. And what happens if you don't make that lease payment? Initially, you lose that store, right? 
But if you fail on a bunch of leases at the same time, you're going to have the same, you're going to meet the same fate as Caldor and Bradley's two discount retailers in the US that were shut down because lessors got together and they sued and they said the company's not making the payments, therefore it should be done. So I'm going to count all interest bearing debt and I'm also going to count all lease obligations. Accountants in the US have danced a silly little dance for a long time where they classify leases as operating leases and capital leases. If a lease is classified as a capital lease, it is treated as debt, so you will see it on the balance sheet. But if a lease is classified as an operating lease, and 90% of leases are classified as operating leases, here's what happens. It shows up as an operating expense, not a financial expense, and there is your biggest source of off-balance sheet debt. 85% of all the off-balance sheet debt in the world takes the form of operating leases. And it's true outside the US, it actually is even looser. Most leases outside the US are treated as operating leases. They're not treated as debt. We're going to have to fix that because that is the biggest source of debt for retailers and restaurants. And if I don't treat it as debt, I get a very skewed vision of how much they borrowed and what they cost to capitalists. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to put into debt. Now let's talk about the cost of debt. I'm going to tell you what I'd like to measure, and then I will talk about how to get there. For the cost of debt, I'd like to measure what it costs you to borrow money long term today. Two key words there, long term today. Here's what I'm saying. You go out and take six month loans, one year loans, two year loans, I don't care. I want your cost of debt if you borrowed for a ten, on a 10 year loan. Why? Because I'm gonna assume that if you take short term debt, you're playing some kind of game that over time that rolled over cost is going to converge on the long term cost. So this actually makes your life very easy. You can take all the debt of a company, short term as well as long term, lump it all together and say, if this money were borrowed long term, what would I have to pay? It's what you'd borrow long term today. What's it today mean? That if you have to reflect today's risk-free rate and today's credit risk in your company. So if you're valiant, you go out to try to borrow money today. You're going to have to pay a really high cost of debt. Why? Because your rating has dropped through the floor. People don't want to lend you money, so they're going to charge you 6, 7, 8, 9% above the risk-free rate. If you're Apple and you go out and borrow money, people will lend, to money, lend you money at a much lower rate. Why? Because you have very little default risk and they feel comfortable lending you money. The cost of debt is a far simpler proposition than the cost of equity because it starts with the risk-free rate, just like the cost of equity does. But instead of adding betas and risk premiums, I added default spread or a credit spread. And that default spread should reflect the riskiness of your company, not overall, but to somebody lending you money. So that becomes the question. How do we measure this current long-term cost of borrowing? Let's start with the easiest proposition. If your company has bonds outstanding and those bonds are traded, what are you going to be tempted to do? The bonds are traded, what should you be able to observe? The price of the bond and the interest rate on the bond. You can say, hey, you know what? AT&T has 10-year bonds outstanding. They're trading, and they're trading with a yield to maturity of 4.53%. That is my cost of debt. Sounds easy, right? First, you've got to have bonds outstanding for this to happen. Those bonds have to be traded, which is actually uncommon. Most corporate bonds get issued. They disappear into somebody's portfolio for the rest of eternity or until maturity. You might say, I find a price on Bloomberg. Most bo corporate bond prices come from bond pricing matrices, which is the, the, the investment bankers and the brokers actually just look up typical, you know, typical trading. It's not a bad way to look it up. But I, I don't think I, I remember the last time I used a yield to maturity on a corporate bond as my cost of debt, and here's why. Can a risky company issue a safe bond? It can, right? Because when you buy the bond, what do you base the interest rate on? what the backing for the bond is. If I'm a risky company with some really safe assets and I can carve out those assets and issue bonds against those assets, guess what? You will have, see very little risk in the bond. You will set a low interest rate. And if I take that cost of debt and, and generalize to the entire company, that's not going to be the right cost of debt for the company because the overall company is much riskier. So my suggestion is even if your company has bonds outstanding, you can look up the yield to maturity. Don't use that yield to maturity as your cost of debt. It's a nice number to know, but it's not a good measure of the cost of debt. But here's the bonus. If your company has bonds outstanding, in usually, this is not required, but usually, 
what else should you be able to find for your company? A bond rating. You know that you don't need a bond rating to issue bonds, but almost every company that issues bonds does go out and get a bond rating. Why do you think that is? Why does a company that, I mean, if, you're, if it's not required, why pay the ratings agency 0.001% or whatever you pay them to get a bond rating? Because if you decide to issue a bond and you say, look, I've decided to skip this rating process, and I'm an investor thinking about buying your bond, what's the message I get? That you're trying to hide something, and therefore I'm going to treat you as a C-rated bond. So you are, in fact, going to go out and get a bond rating. And the advantage of getting a bond rating is ratings agencies actually attach two ratings to companies. One is a bond rating for the bond, which reflects the riskiness of the bond. But they will also attach a bond rating for the company. So we go into Moody's, and you look up the bond rating for your company, and you see two ratings. Don't be surprised. The rating you care about is the rating for the company. Now, this is a little dangerous. But if you assume that ratings agencies know what they're doing, and you assume that they're good at assess assessing default risk, you can take that bond rating and view it as your measure of default risk in the company. And the advantage of having a rating for the company is ratings can be translated into default spreads relatively simply. How? By looking at publicly traded bonds in each ratings class, you can say you're a triple B rated company, you're going to pay about 2.2% more than the risk free rate. That number is a shifting target. I will give you ways of looking it up. But if you know the rating for the company, you're pretty much home free. You can get a default spread and a cost of debt for the company. So that takes care of any company that has bonds and ratings. Yes? That's the last step. So we'll talk about what to do if you don't have bonds outside. You know the 90% of companies around the world have no bonds or ratings? But they do have debt. How do most companies around the world borrow money? They'd go to the bank and they take a loan. Doesn't mean that they don't have debt. Doesn't mean that, do they credit risk still? I mean, banks, and historically, banks have looked at your books and come up with, hey, you're a risky company. I can't look over their shoulders. It's usually proprietary data. So I'm going to try to attach a cost of debt to these companies, not based on what they actually borrow at, but based on how much default risk I think they have. And to do that, I'm going to act like a ratings agency. That sounds complicated, but ratings agencies, I'm going to argue, are the most transparent beasts on the face of the earth. It's not because they want to be, but because of what they tell us. They tell us the rating for every company, and they give away the game. This is what we look at to get the rating. I'm going to do some reverse engineering, and I'm going to ask you, give me your financials. I'm going to act like a ratings agency. I'm going to look over your financials, and I'm going to come up with a rating for your company that I think the ratings agency would attach to. I call that a synthetic rating. Why? Because I'm making it up. It's not an actual rating. I'm acting like a rating saying you're triple B rated, you're single B rated. And once I get that rating, I'm going to use that to come up with the default spread. And in doing all of this, remember to stay currency consistent. You know what I mean by that? When I did cost of equity, I said, make a choice about the currency, stick with it all the way through the cost of equity calculation. You can't now magically switch currencies when you do cost of debt, even if the company borrows money in another currency. So for Baidu, I did the cost of equity in Chinese yuan. But Baidu borrows almost all of its money in US dollars and euros. But the fact that they borrow money in euros or, and dollars doesn't mean my cost of debt has to, be, can, can be, has to be computed in that currency. I'm actually going to compute the cost of debt in the same currency that I do my cost of equity. So let's look at this process of estimating a rating. As I said, it sounds fancier than, than it really is, because I'm actually going to base it on one ratio. And I'll give you a history of how I came up with this ratio. About 25 years ago, when I first started thinking about this process of trying to attach a rating to a company, I didn't know what the ratings were based on. So here's what I did. I went and found every publicly rated company, which at that time were almost all US companies. And I found about 1,500 companies with ratings. I used the S&P ratings for that year. So I took the ratings for the company. So I have 1,500 companies. They've given me the ratings for every company. And S&P actually on their website in those days used to list the eight ratios they used to come up with the rating. So I took the eight ratios. Ratios like EBIT divided by interest expense, which is the interest coverage ratio, EBITDA by fixed charges, you know, you know, EBITDA divided by debt. So basically, they gave me eight ratios. I took all eight ratios. I put them in the same Excel spreadsheet. 
So I ended up with 1,500 companies, ratings in the first column, eight ratios in the next eight. And then I did some reverse engineering. See what I was trying to do? I was trying to figure out why were the AAA rated companies rated AAA? Why were the AA rated companies double? So essentially, I just sorted by rating, and I looked across the ratios. Eyeballing 1,500 rows was kind of messy. So I did a correlation between the rating and each ratio. I wanted to find out which of these eight ratios is doing the heavy lifting and which ones are along for the right. And in the 25 years since I've repeated this process, every time I do this, the correlation between ratings and interest coverage ratios is about 55%. You tell me your interest coverage ratio, I can guess your rating. And all of the other ratios put together make the 55% go to 65%. So you're saying, why do they even throw the other seven ratios? If you're a ratings agency or any kind of measurement entity, you've got to throw noise into the process. It's the nature of your business, right? Why do you need to throw noise in the process? Because otherwise people will be replicating what you do like crazy. So they've got to say things like, we have a committee, we have qualitative analysis, we have you know, these, these people who get together, look at the details of your company. All of that is, you know, you're adding this 3% correlation. I don't have to have a precise rating. All I need is a rough estimate of the rating. So I'm going to use that process to estimate a rating. So let me start with my easy companies first. I had three companies, Disney, Deutsche, and Vale, for which I had an S&P rating. Single A, single A, A minus. The risk-free rate depends on the currency choice I made. For Vale and Disney, I had chosen to go with US dollars, so the risk-free rate is a US dollar. Deutsche, the risk-free rate is in euros, because I'm doing everything in euros. The default spread that goes with the single A rating is 1%. At least in 2013, you have a single A rating, you'd, have, you'd be paying a default spread of 1%. You add the 1% on to the risk-free rate, you have a cost of debt of 3.75% in US dollars for Disney, 2.75% in euros, and 4.05% in US dollar terms for Vale. That's it, that's my pre-tax cost of debt. So if you have a rating, cost of debt is almost trivial. You're done. Two minutes after you look up the, the rating. For Vale's cost of debt, if I wanted to convert into REIs, remember the little trick we did when we did you know, US dollar cost of equity, where you adjusted for the inflation difference? I took the US dollar cost of debt, 9% inflation and 2% in the, in, in the US, 9% in Brazil. My cost of debt, if I decide to do everything in Brazilian reais, would be 11.19%. Which one should I use? It depends on what currency I'm doing my cost of equity in. So again, get comfortable moving across currencies using that inflation difference. So now let me look at my other companies for which I did not have a rating. In fact, I decided to even compute the rating even for the companies that I did have a rating just to see how close I got to the actual rating. So here's the ratio I use, interest coverage ratio, because it explains 55% of what's going on. So if your feeling is, I would pick a different ratio, EBITDA by fixed charges, I'm not picking the best ratio here. I'm picking the ratio that ratings agencies seem to be using to come up with the rating. And EBIT divided by interest expenses seems to be the ratio they focus on. So I computed the interest coverage ratio for all of my companies, except Deutsche, and I'll explain why, for Deutsche I didn't even try. Now, let me ask you, as a lender, do you want that number to be a high number or a low number, that interest coverage ratio? What makes you feel more comfortable? You want a high number because you feel more protected. If you have an interest coverage ratio like Disney does of 22.57, for every dollar in interest expenses, they have $22.57 in operating income. You're going to sleep a lot more soundly than lending money to Tata Motors where dollar in interest expense, you're covered by only $4.51 in operating income. So the higher the interest coverage ratio, the safer you feel. So we're moving towards assessing credit risk. So you're saying Disney feels safer to me to lend to than lending to Tata Motors, but we're still not home because you can't convert that feeling into a default spread. So every year, here's what I do. I create these lookup tables where if you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is, I'll guess your rating. And I create two versions of this lookup table. One for large companies, large defined in terms of market cap, greater than five billion in US dollars and one for small companies. And if you're an emerging market company, I put you into the small company column, even if you're a large company. Why? Because life's not fair. If you're a large company, ratings agencies seem to cut you a lot more slack than if you're a small company. The same interest coverage ratio will give you a higher rating if you're a $50 billion company 
than a half a billion dollar company. It will give you a higher rating if you are a developed market company than an emerging market company. So all I have to do is take my interest coverage ratios, go to this lookup table, check to see what the market cap is, and pick a rating. So let me start with Disney. Large market cap company, right? 130 billion in market cap. Interest coverage ratio of 22.57. So I'm going to take the first column. 22.57 puts me way up above the 8.5. So if I base my rating entirely on interest coverage ratios, Disney should have a AAA rating. You take Vale, large market cap but emerging market company. So I'm going to use a small company column. And if I look at 11.67, I'm sorry, 11.67, the rating I would give Vale would be AA. You see Vale with the AA rating? Hang in there. That would be the rating I would give them based on just the interest coverage ratio. If I look at Tata Motors, 4.51 emerging market company, 4.51 puts me to A minus barely. They were lucky not to drop into triple B because there's a cutoff, four and a half. For Baidu, 23.72 small cap emerging market company, 23.72 is way above their triple A rating. Again, you're saying, no way will Baidu get a triple A rating. I agree. But I'm going to argue that it doesn't really matter that much. You shouldn't be freaking out about the AAA rating. And we'll see in a minute why that's going to be true. And finally, Bookscape. You're saying, but it's a private store. You can't get a private business. You're not going to get a rating. Remember, these are synthetic ratings. I can rate whoever I want. I can rate you as an individual if you tell me your interest coverage ratio. I'm not S&P or Moody's. Why do I have to be bound by any rules? So in this case, I'm going to attach a rating to them based on their interest coverage ratio, 5.16 of A minus. I have now converted your interest coverage ratio into a rating. And once I have the rating, I can get a cost of debt. Let me pause though and check the rating I got for my three, remember for three of my companies I had an actual rating, right? So let me check my synthetic rating against the actual rating to see how close I got. For Disney, I gave them a triple A rating, their actual rating is single A. So what's going on here? Their interest coverage ratio reflected a really good fiscal year that had come. They made lots of money that year. Now think about it. When you're a rating agency, you don't rate companies based on what they make in any one year. You look at them over time. In fact, one way you can modify the approach I use is instead of just using last year's operating income, you could look at average operating income over time. And if you do that, you do push down the rating for Disney because they've had bad years and good years. So part of the reason my rating is so high is I focus everything on 2012, 2013 income, which pushed up my interest coverage ratio and pushed up my rating. It's a fixable problem, and I'll explain why I didn't try to fix it. With a AAA rating, their cost of debt would be about 3.75%. With a single A rating, the cost of debt is 4.75%. In the cost of capital, the effect of playing that all through is going to be like 0.15%. And, and there's no point really finessing this to get a more precise cost of debt because the effect on the cost of capital is going to be fairly small. In fact, that actually should tell you why I didn't spend so much time on Baidu's AAA rating. Completely unrealistic, but only 5% of Baidu's capital comes from debt. 95% comes from equity. So the fact that this is such a small proportion of the firm means that even if I get the cost of debt off by half a percent or 1%, it's not going to make a big difference in your cost of capital. So if any of you have companies where there is very little debt, many of you are doing technology companies, companies like Google and Facebook, the debt ratio is 3%, 2.5%, 4%. Please don't spend two weeks estimating the cost of debt for your company. I'd rather that you just pick a number out of the air and move on. Because the effect on the cost of capital is almost non-existent. The more debt you have, the more you should be focusing on what's the cost of debt for my company. Vale's synthetic rating was AA. Its actual rating is A-, minus, but there's a very simple explanation for this. Vale is a Brazilian company. You're saying, so what? When I took my interest coverage ratio and converted to rating, I was just looking at the interest coverage ratio, right? But if you're an emerging market company, whether you like it or not, and it's not fair again, you're going to be tarred with that you're an emerging market company. I'm going to charge you more. Your cost of debt is going to be higher. So basically, when you look at how ratings agencies rate emerging market companies, they do incorporate what country you're in. So if you're a Greek company or you're an Argentine company, whether you like it or not, you're going to have a lower rating. In fact, until about a decade ago, ratings agencies had a very explicit way of doing this, where you, for a company, they put in what was called a sovereign rating ceiling. You know what that means? That if you're a company in a double B rate, like Nigeria's rating is B2, which is junk. 
You could be Dangodi Cement, which is the largest, most profitable Nigerian company. You know what the ratings agency would tell you? You're in a really good company, you make a lot of money, but guess what? Your rating can be kept. It's not quite fair because there are some companies that do escape that ceiling. Petrobras, about 10 years ago, was able to borrow money at a rate lower than the Brazilian government was able to borrow money. People were more willing to lend to the company than the country. But for a long time, rating agencies put that rating ceiling. They've removed that ceiling, but it's still part of the rating process. They do assign lower ratings to companies which are in risky countries. And finally, for Deutsche, I just took their actual rating. Saying, so why do you compute an interest coverage ratio? Why do you think I didn't compute an interest coverage ratio for Deutsche? What do you think the interest coverage ratio is going to look like for a bank? Remember, they pay interest expenses on debt. That's true. What else do they pay interest expenses on? All those deposits you make? If you compute an interest coverage ratio for a bank, it's going to be barely above one, even for the healthiest bank. It's really not a meaningful way of thinking about how risky is a bank. So when you lend to a bank and you think about risk, what are the things you worry about? How much regulatory capital do they have? With Deutsche in 2016, I'm terrified. Why? Because the bank's regulatory capital has dropped. In fact, you probably read the news story yesterday that they're issuing $8.5 billion of fresh equity. So you're going to be focusing on very different things. So later when we talk about, hey, does a bank borrow too much? We're not going to be looking at the conventional way of interest coverage ratios and ratings, but we'll come up with a different way of thinking about ratings and cost of debt. But I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I already have a rating for Deutsche. I'm not even going to try to compute a synthetic rating. Let's do this for the other companies. Though. I have a synthetic rating for my three companies, for Bookscape. Uh, for Bookscape, that's all I have is a synthetic rating. To get to a cost of debt, I start with the default spread based on the A- minus rating. I add that onto my risk-free rate of 2.75%, I get a cost of debt of 4.05%. But here I'm going to pause and throw something into the mix. We, I said there are two ways you can raise money. You can use equity or you can use debt. And for 100 years in the US, and perhaps in much of the rest of the world, when you borrow money, the, the government gives you a tax advantage. The tax advantage, of course, is interest expenses are tax deductible. Saying, what does that even mean? So you go out and borrow money at 4.05%. And your tax rate, as in the case of Bookscape, is 40%. So you pay 4, so you borrow 4, point, you pay 4.05 million in interest expense. What are you allowed to do next? You're allowed to claim the 4.05 million as a tax deduction, which reduces your taxes by 40% of 4.05. Your tax savings that you're going to get are going to be the tax rate times the interest expense. The tax rate you should use here is the tax rate on your last dollar of income. And let me explain why. Interest saves you taxes at the margin. You have a billion dollars in income, and you have a hundred million dollars in interest expenses. Think of what you report as taxable income. Billion minus a hundred is 900 million. You saved on taxes on the last hundred million of your income, not the first hundred million, not the middle hundred million. It's the last hundred million. It's the tax rate on your last. The reason I emphasize that is when you look at companies' financial statements, they would report a tax rate. And that tax rate is usually an effective tax rate. How is that computed? Come on, somebody must be an accountant here. They can help me. It comes by taking your taxes and your income statements, which are accrual taxes, and dividing by taxable income. It's an average tax rate across all of your income. And for US companies last year, that number was about 26%. The marginal tax rate in the US, the tax on your last dollar of income, is about 40%. It's 35% at the federal level, plus state and local taxes, you're very quickly up to 40%. When I do cost of debt, I'm going to use the 40% tax benefit because that's exactly the savings you get. Now do you see why the US tax code needs fixing? The US has the highest marginal tax rate in the world, by far now, 40%. I think the next highest might be Japan at 38, but all the European countries are now down to 26, 27, 28, and of course in Ireland you're down to 12.5% or 12%. The U.S. has the highest marginal tax rate. The effective tax rate paid by U.S. companies is very similar to the effective tax rate paid by European companies. So you're basically collecting about the same amount of taxes as European companies are, but U.S. companies are going to borrow a lot more than US, European companies because they're borrowing based on the marginal tax. It's the worst possible combination to have because you're encouraging people to borrow money by having a high marginal tax rate, 
but your tax system is actually not going to collect that money because it's based on effective taxes. So when you do cost of debt, you're looking for the marginal tax rate. And you can see, for Disney, I used to 30, how do you get so precise? Disney actually, in their footnotes, broke out their marginal tax rate. They did you know, federal, state, local, 36.1. For Deutsche and Vale, I used the, the marginal tax rates of the country. For Tata Motors, I used the risk-free rate in Indian rupees. Why well, I was doing everything in Indian rupees. I was not able to get a US ratings agency rating for Tata Motors in 2013. Now, actually, I can. I was able to get a rating from a local ratings agency called Crystal, which is an Indian ratings agency. And what this agency does, it rates Indian bonds relative to each other. So a AAA rating from that agency tells you, you're one of the safest companies in India. You think, so what? If I take that rating of a AA minus, and I come up with the default spread based on that rating, and I add it to my risk-free rate in Indian rupees, I'm not fully capturing the default risk in your company. Because as I said, if you're an emerging market company, you carry your risk on one shoulder and your country risk on the other. So I also added the default spread for India, 2.25%. So when you do emerging market companies and use a synthetic rating, to get to the cost of debt of the company is a two-step process. You take the risk-free rate and you add the default spread for the company and the default spread for the country. When you're talking about the risk, yeah. uh, won't it depend on the countries your company operates in as well? No, that's only for equity. Remember, when you borrow money, the fact that you operate in 17 countries is irrelevant to me. All I care about. One final point here, though, which is uh, when you think about marginal tax rates, and this is a depressing thought I wanted to leave you with, is how many of you plan to work in New York after you graduate? This, I'm not saying, you know, even hopes count. Right? <laughs> so let's go down the list. If you work in New York and you generate income, let's say you work for an investment bank, your dream job, Goldman Sachs. Let's work through your marginal tax rate. What's the federal tax rate you're probably going to be paying? No, you're not a f corporation. Don't try to create things you're not, right? You're an individual. You're going to be paying 39.6% this year. With the health care surcharge, it's about 43%. The marginal tax rate, don't, but that's just a start. So the federal government takes its pound of flesh. Then comes New York State. It's like people lined up outside your door. You know what the marginal tax rate in New York State is? It's 8.5%. So already you're up to about 50%. Oh, I'm not done with you yet. You live in the city? Sorry, we have a city tax of 3.5%. Your marginal tax rate, if you work in New York City, is going to be 52 to 53%. Think about that. So what does that mean? Don't rent too long. Because when you rent, money, when you rent an apartment, what do you allow, what allow as a tax deduction? Zero. You borrow money in New York City to buy an apartment, you're essentially going to be get, pay, even if you pay 4%, you're essentially paying less than 2% because you're getting a 53% tax benefit. This is not just for corporations. In fact, this year, and I know I'm running over, this year, uh, there is talk about removing the interest tax deduction. I don't believe for a second that's going to happen. The entire economy is built on this edifice of tax deduction. If I removed it, housing prices are probably going to drop by 40%. percent i will leave you with that thought. I want to think about why housing prices would be so affected by removing the interest tax deduction. So I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you very much.